Commander Shepard has been recovered. The Lazarus Project will proceed as well. I read it before, like before I was involved in any of it, I was a fan. So the uh, I got, I got, I was like a Christmas gift uh, years ago. I got a, I got a 360, and like the first game that I bought for it was Mass Effect. Awesome! It's yeah. so awesome, so awesome to hear you play Mass yeah. Effect. That's so cool. Welcome to a very special episode of the Lazarus Project podcast. In this episode, we had the pleasure of speaking to the voice of Mass Effect Andromeda's very own Scott Ryder, Mr. Tom Taylorson. My name is Craig, and joining me as always is my co-host, Tim. Hello. As a pre-warning of sorts, this episode was recorded a little while ago. We do want to apologise to Tom, as as with scheduling issues, this one took a little longer than planned. There will be a mention of the actor's strike, which has thankfully ended and a mention of the N7 day before it actually arrived. With all that being said though, let's get into the episode. Today's guest has worked within the video games industry, Tom Taylorson. His earliest credit on IMDb being Mortal Kombat, but with the credits ranging from Bad Batch to God of War. But of course, we within the community know him for his role as Ryder in Mass Effect Andromeda. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you thank for you. having me. Yeah, I think I'm going to start off with the, sure. the first question here. We go here, um, Roger Clark. Did the uh, did the uh, the acting for uh, Arthur Morgan in Re- Red Dead Redemption, Redemption. Two? I think it was. Mm-hmm. Redemption, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So over the past few days, he's he's been getting um, quite annoyed on Twitter for people mm-hmm. calling him a voice actor. Mm-hmm. when he does all the motion capture and stuff so i was mm-hmm. just wondering for for the part of rider did you did you just do the voice or was you the motion capture and how do you like to prefer to be called is it an actor or a voice actor or i mean it's it is all acting if it was just the voice then yeah voice acting and i i don't know if, you know if, if he can no, he can do what he wants um because he was brilliant um but you I really do think that there is a distinction between just the voice and the full performance thing. You know, he performed that role top to bottom, you know, whatever was necessary. Um, I didn't do any PCAP for uh, Andromeda. The, because a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, team was up in uh, <clears throat> Edmonton, and then they, you know, got some work from some of the other satellite studios of, uh, of BioWare, uh, like down in Austin and whatnot, we just, that wasn't possible. And so, and it was cost prohibitive to get everybody together. There, you know, it wasn't going to happen. So they had a team of performance capture people up in Edmonton, actors that they know of and they've worked with, who did all of the, you know, generic <clears throat> um, movements for different characters. And then they would perform for all of the uh for all the cutscenes, uh, the pre-rendered cutscenes, and so we found ourselves dubbing over these actors. Now, the fun part is we didn't see the fully rendered cutscene. We saw them in a you know a PCAP space, you know the black suits with low white balls and everything. Um, and then we would dub over their performances. And what was really what I found interesting, uh, uh, an anecdote on my side was that they changed because of availabilities and who was working and other things uh they changed performance capture actors for scott Ryder part of the way through production and i was having a tough time matching some of what i was doing with the original actor his timings readings just stuff was different and i was like no no i can match this i can match this but it wasn't coming uh, easily or naturally Mm. and uh, they switched over to an Australian gentleman. And I said, hey, that's a different actor. And they said, yeah, this is some so-and-so. We know him. He's a, I was, okay. I matched with him easily, first take, every time. And I was like, oh, I'm glad you guys didn't bring him in. We have the exact same, like, instinct, the exact same, uh, you know, pattern. And it was completely unintentional. But we, was, mm-hmm. we made 
the, that he made the choices that I would have made performing the role. And I just thought that was fascinating. Um, so did they not bring him in because you were struggling? Was, did they bring no, this guy in to fix something else? Because, because he could have had the role. I mean, that, <laughs> he was doing it the exact way I would have, I would have done it. I mean, he could have, he could have played it. It was pretty amazing. Uh, like I said, just the, uh, the timing, the, the, the instincts, it was exactly what I would have done. And so it was very easy to match to. Um, there was talk of at least having like me and Frida in the same room to act some of the Ryder twin scenes, but that never came to fruition. There was no time or opportunity and it just, it wouldn't work with the technology that we were working with at that point. Um, that would be so cool. Yeah. And now though, of course, you know, the people, Hey, who's Andromeda get back together or do they introduce new people? And then, you know, the writers are there. We don't know. And I'm like, yeah, you guys want like old me and old Frida running around a, you know, a soundstage. That's not, you know, it's been a few years and then with Dragon Age where it is, it's like, I don't know when we see anything Mass Effect again. And we don't even know if we'll be involved. So that's why I make that joke of, <laughs> do you really want, you know, your parents kind of shuffling around a soundstage? I don't know about that. But what if you were like the wizened protagonist, not the protagonist, but like the wizened character who sort of, you know, is this the one who guides the new protagonist? I mean, would you be okay with that? Oh, yeah, I think, yeah. you know, because I have rarely to never had the opportunity to kind of come back and like revisit a, a character or a performance. And I think it would be interesting to do something like that, especially with the um, especially with some of the storylines like, you know, uh, like Gil and the possibility of like, you know, raising a child and that kind of thing. And some of those were my favorite, uh, you know, my favorite plots within the game. And I thought, you know, it was interesting, progressive and Things like, hey, you could go somewhere with this. You know, if, if there is a sequel or something else, you know, how do you deal with, hey, I'm, you know, leading this and protecting this. Mm. Oh, wait, I've, I've got a family to worry about now, too. You know, how that changes, you know, uh, the character's decisions and what they're willing to throw themselves into versus, you know, uh, you know a young team throwing themselves into anything. You know, you think of... You know some of the missions where they're slightly comedic you know and mm -hmm. it's you know, it's not funny anymore this is you know life and death for them all the time because they've got you know kids back home that they have to worry about so yeah, yeah that'd be that'd be fine that'd be that'd be fun i just I, I you know and game production and the the story side the storytelling side you know changes every year i think of uh you know people that started out doing you know destiny they were voice voice actors for destiny and now as they tell more story and whatnot, the people that have been doing those voices for years are coming in and performs capturing those characters now. You know, it's like this, you know, a, a new evolution for them to, to continue playing those roles. And it's a, a, a lot of fun. And so, you know, what will that look like within a few years? Do we need the suits anymore? Do we just draw on somebody, you know, or as we did for some of Red Dead 2, they just, yeah, they were capturing our voices, but at the same time, they were matching it. We all had helmets on uh, to record our faces so that they matched your voice and face to whatever NPC you would be pasted onto within the game so that the, it's, you know, the, all that syncs up immediately for them within the tech. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And that was, and that was, you know, a few years ago and that was just for you know, the ran, you know, background randos like me, I mean, I can only imagine everything, you know, went into going to, like I said, putting it together, Arthur Morgan and the rest of the gang. Mm -hmm. So where, where will that be? You know, when, and, you know, Andromeda or the next massive that comes around, who knows? That's a very good question. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know that we've got a list of questions, Tim, but I mm -hmm. really want to piggyback on something. No, no, okay, um, go for it. Um, I was just watching a video the other day, actually, like I've, I was, I was, it was just kind of like one of those sort of overview, sort of talking about all these things with Andromeda. And mm. it was really interesting that they, 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 they made a really good point saying that Andromeda's left a lot of things. It was like Andromeda, I think, was great as one huge setup, I think. Like it, it, that was the kind of message of the video. And there mm. are so many unanswered questions. I was sort of going, I was literally thinking about this when you were saying about Gil, and it was like, mm -hmm. there are so many plot lines and things that were set up in that game that we don't know if we're ever going to really get to conclude, which is mm -hmm. 
it's just it's it's crazy to think about really it's a bit daunting really like this i can imagine like because you said you played the game yourself as well haven't you like yeah. there are certain things that i'm sure you want resolved as well yeah and other things and people or yeah, performances that i didn't get to interact with and you know in playing the game i did uh it's always fun to kind of see stuff in context uh there are points where i went oh, i don't need to play this anymore i lived it you know <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived it dotty you know and uh because because that was weird and i i did a playthrough uh as frida as a uh, sarah because at that point i think it'd be different now but at that point i could not you know play Hearing for the game voice. and he, oh no man and just all my, every choice <laughs> i made and things like that i rem and i remember recording some of that stuff uh and some of it i would go yeah yeah that's that line yeah that's that how that that's how that reads absolutely and every time now and then i go mm, i really could have used a take three um <laughs> but you know it, especially later on we had it down we were going through hundreds of lines every day uh and just just so much to get through and thankfully at the end of the process the the director and uh the audio engineer we were functioning as a unit and just mm -hmm. really able to crank through stuff and with two takes no yeah we've got it you know it was rare that we needed more than two takes on stuff because we just had everything down to a science but yeah the unanswered questions you know the the books were kind of that especially like uh cat valenti's third uh andromeda book they just they said hey we're not addressing this uh tell tell the story of the quarian arc tell the story of why it was delayed and they said she said so what are my you know constraints and they said uh, we're not gonna do the dlc we're not gonna do xyz and enjoy tell a story and uh i i had the the, the privilege of narrating that book and it was still one of the best things i've ever narrated just oh my cat. god so is that in the audible version is it yes yeah i oh. i got to i got to do the audiobook and uh i specifically uh i narrated it in writer voice <laughs> and I then thought, and i, I changed and i was like yeah 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 it's out there somewhere but uh yeah i narrated it as in writer voice and then wound up and I'm like, no, let, let me do the things. And it was with a publisher that I've worked with for years. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do my thing. And so, you know, every alien had the, uh, uh, you know, uh, every sound effect that I wanted. Did you, uh, did, did you do like the proper Elcor thing as well, where you described the emotion sort of thing? Yes, yes. But she yeah. wrote it that way. She wrote it that way. And That's then, great. you know, kind of did my best version of a Batarian for Batarian stuff. Because I don't have like you know, any of the, the yeah, I can't do any of the uh, technical, you know, vocoder switches or drop the pitch or something of that stuff, because you still want to maintain the kind of suspension of disbelief. You, you know, you're listening to one person do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you try to make the Hanar a little, you know, uh, uh, kind of ethereal looking and feeling. And the thing that they kept in there is that I did the volus breathing. Um, <clears throat> so every now and then I would, I would be in the middle of the line for a volus and they kept it in. I was like, they knew, they knew what I was, they were like, at first it's like, what is he doing? And then I'm sure we're like, within a matter of a few paragraphs, the editor went, oh, he's on his shit. He's, <laughs> he's, he's just, he's just, he's a pig in slop. He's just rolling around in it. He, he knows what he's doing. He knows the property. He's part of the property. Just let him go. Just let him go. Um, yeah, so that's all in there. I don't know yeah. where it is, but I have to find that. It that was, yeah, amazing. yeah. It's you know, uh, a lot of times uh, audiobooks are very much work, and that was one of the uh, few times where I was like, "This is not work. I'm just absolutely having fun," you know. Because Frida got to do the first two because they were all uh, the women protagonists, and so they were like, "Well, we're going to throw Tom a bone here," <laughs> and so I got to do this third book, and it was it was it was a joy. Hmm. I didn't know actually. So, so both of you have narrated versions of the audiobooks then. You've yes. Um, when uh, I saw that these books were being published, I actually reached out to Blackstone. Then it was Blackstone Audio. Now they are Blackstone Publishing, and I said, "Hey, this company, uh, Titan Books, is printing a trilogy of of game of you know uh, uh, of books based on Mass Effect," and I said hey <laughs> it might be a neat get for 
Blackstone, if you said, hey, we will produce audiobooks for you, by the way, we can produce audiobooks for you with the two leads. And they reached out, made that pitch, and the and the only like stipulation was they had was that I or Frida narrated it. They didn't give anybody else permission to do it. And so that's what we did. And yeah, it was it was great. And then uh what was nice is that the folks at Blackstone said, Hey, by the way, we now have this great ongoing relationship with, you know, this publisher and publishing like sci fi and stuff we don't tech usually have in our repertoire. Thanks for opening that door. And I was like, Yeah, sure. No problem. So it worked out for everybody. Sorry. Um, I'm sure we want to get to some, yes. some more questions. questions. I'll, I'll, yeah. Sorry. I'll, no, no. I'll, awesome talking about this stuff. Do some quick, quick, I'll do some <laughs> quick answers. <laughs> like I said in the email, I, no, I'm usually please. pretty long winded, but I, but in the email that you listed the questions, I'm like, wow, some of these are really quick answers. Like, yes, no, someday, you know, that kind of thing. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how much we can get through. Yeah, honestly, your your long your your answers about these things are really interesting, though, aren't they? Like, well, thank you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, looking obviously, you say you're a uh, you know a Mass Effect fan, and it's the first game you bought uh, mm -hmm. on the 360. When you got the job of Ryder, how was it knowing that you were going to be replacing Commander Shepard, the the protagonist of the right. the franchise? Um. So there was no callback or anything like that. Like I thought maybe there would be. I knew what I was auditioning for when the auditions came through. And they're checking availability and do all the stuff. They finally pulled the trigger and said, hey, show up to this place. And I, I probably still have the email archived. My, my agent at the time I said, hey, is this, this the real deal? Like I know what this is. I know what this is for. Like is this, is this for real? And he said, I don't know. Just show up and go there. You know, every, you know temper your expectations, everybody. Just show up and do the job and uh you know i showed up first day and you know, they're, they're patching uh uh patching catherine in from uh from edmonton and she was like so um welcome to mass effect what is uh and i'm just like i'm just gonna stay i'm just gonna stay real quiet just shut up and listen to her pitch and other things like that and then when it was done and <laughs> i was able to say no, I know everything you're talking about. I I, I played the entire trilogy all the way through. Uh, you know, I, I love two and I love the move it into three. And I was, you know, no, I'm here. Let's go. Let's go. And I remember uh, there were a couple instances early on in the process when she would say, okay, so this is a Krogan. He's, what am I doing? You know all this. Let's go. <laughs> and it was true. There was a lot of like shorthand we could get to get through stuff. Like I knew what I was, you know, who I was addressing, what they looked like you know, how this felt, um, and is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's rad as heck. There was like, uh, and, and you just kind of went in and, and did it and just, there's a little bit of like, Ooh, is this the real deal? Am I doing this right? Is this okay? But, uh, you know, the casting was right because it didn't necessarily come, I wouldn't say it came, you know, uh, easily because there was work involved, but it came naturally, like nothing felt forced or like it was a bad fit. It just, mm -hmm. It, it just went. Yeah. So there was incredulity at, fr at first. And then, you know, weeks and weeks went by and I still wasn't replaced. I used to make that joke, you know, about being replaced. And, you know, it was, and, and it went can, you on it, can you imagine if it was an Australian? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Australian PCAP actor who was just, ah, that was, that was amazing. Um, but yeah, I, it, but it, it just kept going on. And I was like, all right, well, just this is the job. And then and it did. It continued for like a, you know, a year and a half on and off. Wow, it's it's so cool though that they've got like a package, I suppose, like the Mass Effect intro, with like this is a crow and this is this. Like they 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 do give you all the context, which is quite yeah. Cool. yeah if you ask or whatever it is, um, in that because you're just recording as you go. So early on, we recorded the kind of the primary story beats, and so anytime there was a new character, or something introduced, they would say. Uh, this is a Quarian, or you know, this is this is this person who's this. These these are this, and you give your little background, and then you just go. There's there's no sheet, there's no packet. You never see the script ahead of time. You just go, um, and it's a uh, yeah, it's a neat process. And so you know, you're talking about you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mark Mir, you know, we're not replacing. We're just building on what they did, and it's like okay, you know. Ooh, how would Mark do it? Okay, don't do that. How would Jen do it? Okay, don't do that. 
that's been done, you know, and one of the things they were specific about is, yes, later in the game, the riders are a little more confident, a little more this, but in the beginning of the game, no, they are unsure, maybe a little cocky, you know, that kind of thing. And so we, we played with that and there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, the, the humor and you fun stuff from that. It isn't a joke. I jumped us here blind. We don't know where anyone is or how anything works. And now we're fighting some asshole who wants everyone chained. It's like hitting Andromeda all over again. The shield of bear. Don't make this about the whole initiative. We're here to help, and why am I the one defending your plan? I don't know. I will not be ignored anymore. See, total. But like the, the the Liam, uh, uh, you know, uh, side mission was very much in that venue of a bunch of. Mm. you know space adventure kids you know have having fun danger adventures you know and then it gets you know more serious as the game goes on um you so a lot of the feedback as well like you, you hear each other's voices playing back no. to each other as you know no oh. no if you were lucky so they use a software a proprietary software now uh for uh for bioware called veda which is a way for them to enter scripts and then the script is married to so it looks like, you know, just reading a script script, like a, a, for a film script. But then those cues are married to the audio as you record them. And it crashes a lot. So <laughs> we'll be doing stuff and then you'll lose a take and you feel bad because Veda crashed and you reboot it and you just move on with your day. And sometimes you get through a whole session, Veda doesn't crash and we all go, oh, wow, Veda didn't crash. This is amazing. Um, but you get the cue and if you're lucky somebody else has recorded ahead of time and so uh, when they and so they're able to play the cue before you and you act off that otherwise uh you just act off of your director uh you know for so who for some of the time uh it was uh you know voice directors out of uh out of edmonton and then later on they brought in uh josh dean uh who also has the same read and comedic timing as i do so we could josh and i can never like do anything together they were like why did you choose the same actor for these two different parts uh and and voiced, josh is um, phenomenal yeah he voiced um jenkins didn't he yeah, yeah 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 and so yeah and so josh is just josh is amazing he was wonderful as a director wonderful and we it was we just would play every day it was just playing and then uh uh, uh judy alice lee uh, was the engineer and she now is a, a voice actor, a very good actor in her own right. And it was funny. She, I forget what it was. We, she was talking about something and she was delivering a line or something like that. And Josh and I just stopped and went, the hell are you doing on this side of the glass? Get in the box. Judy, you're amazing. We're like, yeah. What is, she's oh, stop. Like, no, Judy, <laughs> you can do this. Holy crap. And then she played like, a, they got a video of her, like an open mic night and playing guitar and singing. And she was, it was amazing. She was gorgeous and wonderful. And we're like, yeah, Judy, what are you? Jeez, girl, <laughs> go do the thing. And she is now doing the thing. She lives, I believe, it was, I believe, like Colorado, and got a home studio and is doing the thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, but that was like my our team. Every day we would record those folks. Then Josh would spit the lines to me, and I would just react, you know. Um, and that's that's the whole thing. Um, with we, we just and so and I, it blows me away to think that you know. Um, to think that Jen and Mark, they were working off paper and recording into Pro Tools, and then they would spit that into stuff. Yeah. And so when I hear, when I think of like hundreds of lines, you know, within a three, four hour session, I go, yeah, with this system? Yeah, absolutely. And then they would tell me, yeah, Jen's record is like 400 something in a in a session, 400 something cues in a session. And I was like, on, they were like, well, I was Mass Effect 3. So she had three games to build into it. But you were, I was like, Weren't you still using paper at that point? Yeah. <laughs> so dealing with paper and page turns, I was you're still cranking those lines. I was like, that's impressive. That's amazing stuff. I got, you know, I'm cheating by just basically having words thrown in my face and somebody just hitting a scroll wheel. Two in a row, go, two in a row, go, two in a row. Uh so there was always this little thing in the back of my all right, I'm I'm shooting for that, that number. <laughs> I used to write down how many how many cues I would get that day. I still have those pieces of paper around somewhere, like at archives. So, so I know somewhere I know what my peak was. Josh may actually know, remember offhand, but yeah, it was a fun bit. Did you manage to beat the record? I don't think so. And sometimes oh. it was. Sometimes it wasn't fair. Like it depends upon. Well, what's the cues today? Are we just 
randomly discovering things and reacting to discovering things, okay, you can crank. Oh, are we actually acting today? Nah, <laughs> that's going to slow <laughs> things down dramatically, so to speak. Yeah, I can imagine like those more intimate, like companion conversations being a little bit more complex. Yeah, and you take a little more time with it or... Again, sometimes between the writing and the characters and everything, which is like, no, this makes sense. Go, go, go. Other times we'd go, no, that, that the feel is wrong or the mood is off. Do we have the original act? Oh, gosh, good. We have Cora's actor. Okay, listen to her and, and go. Because otherwise, you just, you're also, as the actor, you're depending on the director to have the other actor's takes in their brain. So they're mm -hmm. kind of putting it together mentally in real time if you don't have the other actor's performance available. So if somebody recorded in England earlier in the day or yesterday, that may not be in the VEDA system when I start my day at 9 a.m. So good luck. Hopefully the directors, you know, kind of listened back and forth. And yeah, it's, it's like so many things in video games, it's a wonder any of this ever works out and that it has the emotional impact that it that it gets There's, so there and there are times when i look at something like red dead and i go well that's cheating you guys were in the space together at the same time like of course that scene plays out like that of course the drama is this of course the physicality works like this none of us were ever in the same space at the same time i'm just making it up and then piecing it together later and if and if it works wow that's amazing <clears throat> Cool. Another, another 10 minute yeah. answer. Let's, here we go. That was incredible. Let's, 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 at least some yes or no's, man. We need some yes or no's. Uh, okay, yes or no's. Let's have a quick look at the end. Because <laughs> I know you have a list and I thought, okay. This isn't a yes or no, but Caden or Ashley. <laughs> um, oh, I, I made a very. So I was the biotic. So I didn't need him. Uh, it was a very mechanical choice that I made. I'm like, <laughs> you're going to be on the ship for a whole trilogy because I'm the biotic. And of course, later out, it comes out. She's a space Nazi. So I'm like, ooh, well, you're not coming with me either. You're going to live, but you're not coming with me. Yeah, I rolled oh. with, uh, I, I she, rolled with, was it? She, she she becomes a little bit more like accepting and like, <laughs> like over the course of like the game i would say like in terms yeah. of three i think he, she she mellows and becomes a bit more i don't know i i, I get that like what she said about i can't was what was the line i can't tell the aliens from the animals in the first game like yeah uh, it's, but yeah there's a <laughs> first impressions first impressions yeah. ma'am ma'am yeah. you're on the ship ma'am <laughs> ma'am uh yeah so my crew the whole time was uh uh garrison rex because it's just i'm a front mass you know imagining things and rex is up there beating people up and shooting <laughs> shotguns and then garris is in the back you know uh just popping guys off as, as i as i run midfield yeah yeah like i said it was very it was a long time ago so it was very yeah uh, mechanic mechanically made choices the reapers now, would approve of that brutal efficiency there like yeah the strategic benefit <laughs> yeah yeah, like I said, I was playing games with a a, a different mindset. Um, although, uh, would I make different choices? I don't know. There are more choices available. You know, you look at a Baldur's Gate and you think of how, again, games change, development, all sorts of stuff. You think like, wow, there's a lot more branching paths in this thing. It's like, yeah, because they have a long time to do it. There's different systems in play versus, you know, just Paragon Renegade. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they... You know, maybe they don't even have the opportunity to react to a Baldur's Gate. You know what I mean? Like they have systems in place, and this is this is how the game plays. We can't we can't do that. We know we can't do that. Or between budget and time and everything, we know we can't do that. Well, we're gonna look. You're gonna go. You're gonna look old. You know, by the time these things come out, and that's just that's an issue with game development. You know, there's no once that ship is going, it is exceptionally difficult to to turn it, and so it's just sometimes you get hit by inopportune timing of here's our game. Oh crap, Breath of the Wild, uh, <laughs> it, right? You know, and so Breath of the Wild happens, and even successful open world stuff, you know, Ubisoft climb the tower, open the map type things 
don't hit. And it's because, ah, well, you've got Nintendo that can do whatever they want for however long they want and bring out the thing and polish it with an inch of its life. Um, and I think Baldur's Gate was that, where it's like, here's our role-playing game. And you're just like, okay. And it just looks or feels old because games take like three, four, five years to make. And so I don't think we'll see a reaction to Baldur's Gate for for a while. I mean, we are still pumping out roguelikes, uh, you know, in the vein of like Dead Cells and uh, Binding of Isaac, and we're still pumping out <laughs> my my soft spot, which is uh, roguelike uh, 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 deck builders, you know, uh, Slay the Spire. And it's like, Slay the Spire kind of nailed it, but y'all keep trying to do more. Okay, fine. Like, the net, what's the next level of that? I don't know. People keep pumping them out. But it, it might be a while before we see somebody go, okay, wait a minute. What if I do this and this? And, oh, look, the deck builder's better. Yeah, I guess, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes or no? I'm sure I've got some yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Is Mass Effect 2 the best game? <laughs> um, probably. It's it's the it's the Empire Strikes Back, which is arguably the best Star Wars film. Just top to bottom, it 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 just works, and it ends on a beautiful cliffhanger, and has some of the best characters and characterizations and performances, and because it's nice, it's a nice meaty middle. Mm. I feel really bad for saying that now because I do. I do love Andromeda. <laughs> oh, I, I appreciate that. Um, but I do, I, I, don't, I hope nobody from Bioware hears this, but I do make the joke with my friends and, others, and in other spaces like, hey, I helped close the studio. You know, it's, not my, <laughs> it's not my fault. But it was like, ah, yes, Mass Effect Andromeda. I closed the studio. Ha ha. You know, um, and that's, like, that's the joke I always make. And that's like, that's on top of when I was told uh, by the the Persona gang, uh, the PCB, the people that brought me in and, and uh, did the localization and the directing and all that. There's like, hey, this will be the thing. This will be the thing, man. Like, you're doing conventions and all this other stuff. And I was like, mm -hmm, sure. Sure, whatever. Heard it before. Heard it before. Nothing nothing changed. Nothing changed. <laughs> I had this really good job for a year and a half, and that's what, I, that's what I got to look at it. You know, I was already relatively old when I came into it, and then by the time Persona rolls around, and they're like, hey, this could be a, a game changer for your career. I'm like, mm, yeah, sure. Sure. Sure it will be. You know, it's uh, uh, you can hope, and then it's like, no, no, you've been here. You know, you, if something changes, and it's like, yeah, I'm working at the rate of, I don't know, you know, uh, 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 some of the other big people, you know, the critical role people, it, it, I won't. I will. I won't notice it. It'll just be like some slow transition, and suddenly, oh, I'm doing this thing, or oh, wow, I'm doing a lot less audiobooks. Oh, because I'm doing these other cool things. Uh, but that's not happened. And at this rate, I'm, I'm like, ah, you know what? Probably not going to happen at this rate. But that's okay. I've I've had a good run. <laughs> I, I know it's a, a long way off, but oh. Mike Gamble has hinted that Andromeda is going to be returning for the next game. Um, so do you, do you think we'll see Ryder again in that game? Do you think there's more stories to be told? I hope so. I have, I, I can't say anything about anything. I have, um, I have like bits and pieces on the rumor mill, but that's like it, you know? Um, I think, re I think it's all, everything is like all in like pre-production right now or pre-pre-production where they're just bandying ideas and getting a story and a narrative in place, uh, you know, as they feverishly try to, <laughs> you know, finish Dragon Age. Um, so yeah, yeah but... I'm, so I'm, I'm hopeful just because I, like I said, I, I'd loved, uh, was it, uh, Rob Paulson always says, what's your favorite job? He goes, the next one. And for me, that would be, it's like that bit. Does that that be the next job? You know, I just I I love working, and if I get to, I'm sure it'll be like a totally new team. But you know, if any of those people, if any of us get to play play together again, oh, that'd, that'd be the best. It's just it was just a joy to work on as a property, uh, and then just as a performer, and to be like the first thing I booked after moving to LA. I mean, that, that's a absolute privilege. Mm. I do honestly believe that like Andromeda deserved so much more and 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 
you yourself as a rider and of course the, the female rider you both deserve so much better i think you deserve so much more because i think both both of you had so much more to give to that it didn't oh. deserve the backlash that it got Not no at all. well thank you i we you know frida we, we tried to do the thing and then frida's like you know what? i'm off social media i'm done with this because oh she's a very strong outspoken woman in social media space it's like yeah she's gonna get trash and she's still an exceptionally <laughs> strong ass kicking you know uh uh you know uh opinionated uh woman and i love her for it um and we it just kind of went oh well that happened again you know everybody will say hey this is gonna do a thing or change a thing and and it doesn't you know there's so many things that are just not up to you in all of this so you just kind of roll on you know since then frida has been in a bunch of those she's an apex legend i mean there's also you know there's all sorts of stuff you know i went off and i did the you know persona during the uh persona during the uh, during covid during lockdown that whole all of strikers was recorded uh during lockdown so all of that is it's just not up to you and you just kind of roll with it yeah yeah we were we were bummed because we wanted to do more we wanted DLC. We we did. Frida and I were like, we like had prints made. She's like, yeah, I'm gonna sign stuff. And no, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and that's when Frida was like, nah, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not. I'm not gonna do that train. That's not my jam. And and it's true. She was like, no, I'm gonna hermit and <laughs> I'm gonna record my stuff from home and do all this great stuff. And she has, uh, you know. And as time went on, that that's kind of where I went too, just in a different direction with doing more you know more audiobooks because that was already a thing laid out for me hmm. have you, you ever do quite a lot have then? you met frida and sorry sorry no go ahead I've been i was gonna say <laughs> have you ever met frida in like real life or has it all just been through we had work? lunch yesterday <laughs> we had lunch yesterday yeah i don't know I, I i don't know how many of some of the stories that you know yet so um when mass effect started when we were working on it so before this uh, you probably know about Octodad, the, the game Octodad. No, no. okay. No. <laughs> Some kids, uh, they were kids. Now they're like parents themselves. Uh, guys out of DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, it's got a great animation and game development program. And a small team of guys that call themselves the Young Horses developed this game called Octodad. It was a uh, kind of a physics-based, uh, it, it's a co-op but you're an octopus trying to masquerade as a regular person on land, okay? And uh, SAG-AFTRA has a deal with DePaul where they have... Uh, DePaul can call in actors from the area. We get paid 100 bucks, and they get to just... They choose from our auditions what actors they want to call in for their projects, and we come in and record for these student projects. So I got called in to do this student project um, for called Octodad. And a friend of mine, uh, Anne Sonneville, was called in to play the mom in this thing. And I was the father, so we're trying to do things. It was a fun ride. Great. A couple years later, these guys have graduated. And they are making an official sequel to their student game called Octodad Dadliest Catch. And they called me back in to play Octodad again. I was like, sure, guys, let's go. Um, and then, and and they had a Kickstarter and everything, and I, I gave them money for the Kickstarter. <laughs> I kickstarted the game. Uh, I don't think they knew that until years later. But then they said, hey, we're, we're looking for the uh, somebody to play the, the mom again. And I don't know. And I said, um, you know, Ann Sonneville that you worked with before is still here. And she's better than she was a few years ago. You, you give her a call. And they did. They brought her in. And so they were looking to cast uh, the young girl and, so, and uh, other stuff in the game. And there was this really opinionated person talking in uh, uh, some online discussions on Twitter about game development. And they clicked over to her profile and her name was, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and her name was Frida Wolf. And they're like, hey, we noticed that you're a voice actor. In addition to knowing game dev, uh, she spent about a decade in game development before voice acting and so they said would you audition for this yeah sure so suddenly she got the part of the child in the game and then i like me she plays all of the rando non-player characters in the spaces in the game 
Um, so that is the core group. And the three of us actually had lunch yesterday, which was delightful um, because we're all trying to get out of our little boxes for the first time in a long time. So first moving to LA, I knew Frida because we'd worked quote unquote together on Octodad, Dadliest Catch. And we'd gone, you know, back and forth and met up when we first, I first moved out here, all of this stuff. So we knew each other. We'd worked with each other, sort of. Um, so at, at this point, I've been, I've had a few sessions for this, for this thing, for uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. And I'm in my booth working on some audiobook, and uh, I get a call. And it's Frida. And at this point, Frida is living down uh, in like Anaheim or Orange County, somewhere down there, and commuting up to LA every day. So she has like just a very long drive all day, every day, as she's bopping in and out, doing sessions, auditions, whatever it is. So she just calls me uh, after after a session. Hmm. And she says, yeah, I'm just calling, talk. I was like, yeah. Now, she says, I broke the NDA. I say she, so I'm going to tell my version of the story, and she will <laughs> yell at me, you know, in, in real time. So we're going back and forth. We're just chatting about what we're working on, whatever we're doing. And I said, yeah, I just had a, a session over here in, in Burbank, whatever. Frida says, you, you had a session over Burbank today? Yeah, the morning. Oh, really? I did, I did too. Was it, was it over at Formosa? Yeah, maybe it's over at Formosa. She says, would it happen to, uh, would your session happen to involve a, uh, a well-known space IP? <laughs> and I said, yes, it did involve a well-known space IP. And then she's like, can you keep a secret? I'm like, yeah, I can keep a secret. Can you keep a secret? Yeah. And she says, I'm, I'm the, the female player character in the next Mass Effect game. And I said, that's funny. I'm the male player character <laughs> in the next Mass Effect game. And this devolves into 10 to 15 minutes of us just going, shut up, shut <laughs> up, shut up. <laughs> Um, so and, Frida played Mass Effect before as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. That's so, so cool. So we knew, and we were just like, "This okay." So we just got to keep this in the down low. Let's just let's mm, shh, quiet. So we would see each other in passing as I would leave, and she would come in, or back and forth. Um, I usually did the morning slot. She did the afternoon slot because of her commute, and for me, you know, the the kids, I could pick up my son from school after dropping him off. Um, so. Later on, they thought we're going to shoot some, you know, little promotional videos with these with these two, and they see us hanging out. They're like, "Do you guys know each other? Did you know?" And we had to admit, "Yeah, we we knew about the job a long time ago." And we told the car story, and like, "Wait, you guys know each other?" And we tell the Doctor Dad story, and they're like, "This is nuts," because they had no idea that we had done this other game before and knew each other and whatever. So they're like, well, this is great. And we did, you know, we did those little, those little uh, video shorts and they went off without a hitch and it's, yeah, it's just the, the strangest, wildest thing. And uh, yeah, it's one of the favorite parts about it. It was just this serendipity. There's so much, you know, one of the shames about the game, not necessarily coming together, uh, you know, and finding its audience immediately and us getting to do DLC and whatever is that there was so much amazing uh, serendipity surrounding the project. The first thing I booked after moving to LA, you know, Freed and I working quote unquote together, knowing it's so much stuff like that, that it's just, uh, it's, it, it's almost like there was too much of that cool stuff happening that, well, it had to have a failure somewhere. And, you know, cause it was, it was too good. It was too good. At least on my end, it was like too good to be true. So yeah, I'm surprised you didn't know that. That's like the that's the podcast story that I <laughs> that I usually tell. That it's like I said that that piece of serendipity that we just knew each other and it was great and yeah. So that was the fun thing about playing the game too is it's just I'd hear Frida's interpretation of certain lines and I go, oh wow, no, never, never would have done that. <laughs> no, she found a way, and it was because you know I think that just at the core what we were doing and who we felt these characters were. Um, we had very different interpretations. And then our, our kind of head canon, as time went on and we learned more about uh, the Ryder family and the parents and all these other things like that, is that Frida and I kind of uh, realized separately and then together, oh, Sarah takes after dad, but Scott takes after mom. 
And then as we listened to our choices, we were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Sarah really is the tough, no nonsense thing, you know, and, and Scott is much more, you know, oh, jaw ice cream, you know, that bit, like there's, there's that thing. And it was just, it just turned out that, yep, that headcanon completely and absolutely functions. It was just unintentional. Again, things that we didn't work for or try, you know, try to strive to have happen just happened. It just worked. It came naturally. That That's good casting and all sorts of stuff coming together. Wouldn't it be incredible if you did some real life Rider family reunion? Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, we got to, yeah, yeah. That'd be Clancy, Clancy Brown and uh, and you. We, uh, we got to yeah. meet him. Uh, he was there like finishing his day and they gave him a bunch of swag and we're just sitting at the table. And of course we've grown up watching Clancy Brown and listening to him. And he's just, <laughs> it was just like somebody's dad coming through the studio. We're like, hi, he's, oh, hey, how are you guys doing? Yeah, good, good, good. Oh, I'm just, yeah, my, my son will love this stuff. So I'm bringing him. <laughs> we're just like, <laughs> it was just, it was just the best. And he moved. And then like Frida and I, I'm just looking at each other. We're like, that was cool. That was cool. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Like I said, it was, it was the things that could have been, it was kind of fun and cool. Like I said, and I was relatively new to LA. So just like running into people like that was just, cool and strange and you know um i uh i was an audition and i'm just waiting for um uh waiting for you know the person to come up bring me in it's just from radio something or like that and this uh woman comes in with big glasses and a hat and she asks if they have a different script i said no it's the same script for everybody but i think they're having something different for women and i look over at her she sits down and she's looking at the script and she's waiting and i text my wife hey honey because we're both like 90s kids uh 80s 90s kids hey honey I'm just, I think I'm just sitting here chatting with Lisa Loeb. <laughs> and she's just texting me back, shut up. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm definitely, I'm just sitting here having a chat with Lisa Loeb. You know, it's, uh, it's like, oh, okay, great. Um, or, you know, I'm waiting to go in for something like that. And Freddie Prince Jr. waltz in, orders an omelet, goes in, does some work, I think for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Rebels. And then leaves, he eats his omelet and leaves. And I'm like, so is Freddie Prince Jr. here often? <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's just down the street and he, he'll come in and do the ADR and pickups for, for rebels here. Cool. You know, again, this is like first, my first few years, you get used to it a little bit over time, but it's, it's especially, like I said, early on, I was, it was very cool. And then to just kind of be thrust into some of those spaces, you know, uh, getting to meet William Sailor, uh, more, uh, more than Solis. He was actually recording the, uh, uh, the the modern day Solarian song for the little Morden Solis statue that sings it. He was recording that the day I was coming in, so I got to sit and chat with him for a little while. It was yeah, it was really cool. So I'm like, wow, it's like, hey, I'm Mass Effect too. Remember me? <laughs> it was, but he was just rad. As, he was just rad as hell. He's just rad as hell. Um, and you know, and I get to then introduce him to in so, in some ways, like to my kids. It's like, hey, you know, you know, uh. Rigby from regular show. Yeah. I'm like, that's that guy. Like, you know, met him rad dude. And the kids are like, yay. Yeah. So that's a little less now. And of course now we don't even leave our home studios anymore. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big change. I kind of miss it. And that was one of the reasons why uh, Frida Anna, and myself, we, we went out yesterday is just to see people for a change. There's very, there's a lot less seeing, meeting each other in the parking lot as Frida said yesterday, you know, I'm coming into a session, uh, she's leaving or vice versa or something. It's just, yeah, the, the landscape has changed with, uh, with COVID. So, so yeah, it's a lot of working from home then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I did a cartoon earlier this year, came in and I thought, oh, this is gonna be great. First big cartoon back after a little while I go into the booth, uh, the engineer leaves. So the engineers on the other side of the glass, I'm in the booth and the writer, director, producer, everybody else is up on a big TV screen. Nobody was there. Nobody was there. So we finished it. Great. And then they said, Hey, uh, your character's coming back. We have another episode. I was like, great, let's go. And then they said, what's your home studio like? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, it's, it's really good. It's where I recorded all of bad batch and everything. It's really good. So I did the second episode here and I did ADR for that cartoon here like a week ago. And it's just, yeah. I mean, it's nice. Don't get me wrong. You know, the house is nice. I got the dogs, all this other stuff, but, um, I, I miss people. I, I didn't realize how much, um, when I stopped doing theater, I had students asking me at, uh, 
at Columbia College in Chicago and elsewhere. It's like, hey, do you miss doing theater? Because these were theater. I was teaching voice acting, uh, and these a lot of these people were theater students. And I would say, you know what? I miss my friends. That's what I miss. I do not miss. I I, I love getting my nights and weekends back. <laughs> you know, I don't miss tech rehearsal and all this other work that comes with live theater. But I really miss my friends. And there are some people from my Chicago live theater days that are still, um, you know people that I absolutely adore and miss as we've scattered across the U.S. And, you know, my buddy Scott graduated from Juilliard and now his wife has been Tony nominated and he's done all this stuff. And then my buddy John, he's often to North Carolina, but this is after he was on the Jack Ryan show. He was in Dope Sick and all this other stuff. His, his commercial with Robert De Niro and years ago and just all these people just scattered to the four winds. But I just remember just doing outdoor theater and Shakespeare crap with these guys when we were young and just having just the best time. And yeah, I miss those people. Do you think you'd ever go back to theater? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love my nights and weekends. Um, I always had a, a bit of a disconnect. Um, so like what you're hearing right now is kind of like my theater voice, trained voice, whatever. This is not what I use for most voiceover. Um, and I've sounded like this since I was 18. And so I'd come out of like university looking like a young 20, whatever, but I'd sound like this. And they were like, well, what do I do with you? What do I do with you? You know, be, are you, you go, I went to, you know, I was, I was in all the shows, did a bunch of stuff. I was very lucky in college and you learn to be like an actor and like a character actor. And then you come out into the working world and they go, no, 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 just do you. And I'm like, what the hell is that? What even is that? You know? Um, and I kind of hit a glass ceiling in Chicago theater. And part of it, uh, I know now is that I was finally up against, uh, people, friends and colleagues that there was at that point as an actor, there was no way I was going to do something better than what they, they were doing. There was no way I was going to best my, my buddy, John or others. They were just, they were better actors at that point and they were more comfortable with themselves. And I, I was not, I was not there. I was not going to be there. But the second I was able to get rid of what I looked like. I could do anything. And it took me a while to realize, okay, I look like this, but I sound like this. So what I need to do is I need to pitch it up a little bit and sound a little bit more the way I look. And then as time went on, I stopped being looked at and I could do whatever I wanted to. And that's where I found, you know, more work. Um, so nowadays, you know, I, I like they still send me, uh, my agents still send me for stuff like anywhere from 20s to 40s. Um, and I'll book it, but I myself am 40 something. I got two kids, house, dogs, you know what I mean? Mortgage. And so I look in the mirror and I see what I'm reading for and I go, yeah, I got it. Let's go. But if somebody says, okay, now be on camera. And I go, I don't know what to do. I, I I'm, I'm more comfortable with me as a performer. I can just come out and just kind of do me or whatever this feels like. But because I've been, I, I, what I work on and audition for and play didn't necessarily age along with me. So when somebody says, okay, play this, I go, I'm not sure, you know, what to do with this because I've been so detached with, from what I look like for, you know, 20 years. So it's a really weird space, uh, you know, that I'm in right now, um, as a performer. So, yeah. Um, so PCAP, there's more of that coming out, you know, coming down the pipeline. So I'm like, okay, I better figure it out real quick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, get back in shape after, you know, COVID years hit me and just growing older and things like that to, to figure out, you know, what this is physically, because I've been detached for so long. Uh, Frida hit a, she would hit, she had hit like a, not a creative something. She's like, well, I got called back for this. Nothing hit. This is work is going okay. She's like, I got to do something. I got to expand. I got to grow. And then she had a realization. She's like, well, you know, the, the old uh, standby, you feel, uh, 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 you grow when you're in your uncomfortable place. And she's like, all right, I need to be really uncomfortable. I'm going to take a stand up class. And so <clears throat> she's been uh, studying stand up and trying to create a tight five. And she's going to go do an open mic night with the rest of her class in a few weeks. And she's like, you know, I'm scared out of my mind and stuff like that. <laughs> <clears throat> and I thought, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's genius. That's brilliant. I love it. And uh, yeah. So, you know, we're all trying to find that. And maybe that'll be for me, you know, finding that one audition or something or other where I go, oh yeah, no, I gotta, I gotta be uncomfortable and, 
you know, be physical, be me for like five minutes and just see if something comes out of that. But do you mind if I very quickly ask how you got involved with the Bad Batch? Because you were talking about that earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, I auditioned. Like, that's... Oh. <laughs> like, for real. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that uh, uh, that character came along, and I, I don't know how they heard through it. So I wound up doing a, one, a one-off episode for, um, for Star Wars uh, Resistance as Agent Wraith. He was just this trooper that they that got blown up at you know later on that and apparently they had the reason I, they called me in for that was they'd heard me audition for something and they were like well we like that voice but it's not right for this imperial officer or whatever so they called me in for this stormtrooper great finish that off and so as this other audition came in through for this other thing for roland for roland durand i was like i, I was at a point where it's like i am nothing's landing this is ridiculous i can't hit anything you know what because they don't tell you it's a he's you know he's a he's a uh uh, uh what is it uh a Deveronian. i got no idea yeah they just said here's the character here's the thing um and i was like you know what let's go irish so i did the whole thing with an irish accent and, 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 and i made it really you know because i was like he's kind of charming but also you know insincere and also like yeah let's just go i just did it just to do it and they booked it. And they're like, just don't do the Irish accent. I was like, you heard through that? Like, yeah. I was like, all right. So then I had to like tie what I did separate from like this idea of a character that I came up with. And and it was great. And I recorded that from home. <laughs> Again, one of those situations where I was like, oh, look, I could be with people. Nope. No people. No nothing. Um, oh. But, you know, to have everybody come in, they show videos of the SpongeBob cast sitting around and standing together, you know, uh, that's they don't do it anymore. It's just, I, you know, I came out here thinking and hoping that would be the thing. And that's not how anything is put together anymore. And it's a, it's a shame because early in my career, I did do radio spots and others with people in the booth. Um, and it was an absolute joy. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's an energy. We, we've gotten good at not having people there, but there is an energy that we, at least as performers miss. Mm, I can imagine it yeah, helps so much more as well. Absolutely. And I, I think it also winds up, because we've been able to up our game as performers, but I think it winds up putting a lot more onto, it's more efficient, it's faster, we get more stuff in the can at a, at a higher rate, but I think it puts a little more uh, onto the director to keep those performances in their head all together and know, okay, I've got stuff that, 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 that'll match together. I have performances that will sound like they bandied off one another. Um, so, you know, more props to the directors for having that in their head, but it winds up being a, a little more of a director's medium. Yeah. With the, um, with the rise of AI coming in, are mm -hmm. you, are you more worried about people like cloning your voice now? You even though the, cause you, you, you get like further and further away from like the studio and stuff. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's good. It is a and will be a concern for anybody along the way. Um, if somebody is going to, you know, utilize my voice for some text to speech something, because let's let's be honest, it's not. None of this is artificial intelligence. There, this all of it is our plagiarism machines. That's what they are. They plagiarize existing works of text, of art, of audio, and. They just cobble it and mix it up and spit it back out. None of it is artificially, intelligently generated. It's all scraping. Uh, so if somebody's going to scrape our stuff, then we should be paid for it, like everything else. You know, we have we've had a residual system for all media in place for a very long time now. Like, pay us. That's all any of us ask is to be paid fairly for whatever work it is, even if it is. Well, I want to like take and remix your work we have that in music too right where if a, a loop or a sample or something is of a certain of a certain size you have to credit somebody and they get money for it you know you think about uh bittersweet symphony verve you know the, uh, they just in the past few years got the rights and money back from that song because the stones went no 
you looped this and this from this song. It's you just you just copied and pasted and, and kind of scooched it around a little bit. No, you you pay us, and that that's that kind of stuff is held up in court. Um, so whether it's done by you know copy and pasting or something like that, or by an algorithm that just scrapes and reproduces, people should be paid for it. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it is a concern, and I know there is enough audio out there for somebody to do something good. I mean, but I've come, you know, 150, 200 audiobooks, all sorts of stuff. It's out there if somebody wanted to feed it. Um, although with the audiobooks, I tend to perform all the characters. So that'd be very funny to hear the computer decide <laughs> that just shit. Well, it's like, why does that phoneme sound that way? Oh, because he it just, yeah, it's not going to be able to do a very good job. You'd have to do a lot more work. Um, yeah, it's it's obviously a concern, and it's it's you know think about this for face actors. They're able to digitally copy and paste stuff, you know, and just put anybody anywhere, and then you just digitally paste an actor over that, and that's two people's performances. But that performance capture person, maybe they don't get any money for it. Maybe the face actor doesn't get any money for being copied and pasted because they didn't technically show up to work that day. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the arguments are already out there for at least paying everybody and taking care of everybody. And that's all anybody's looking out for is their, is their work. You know, the, uh, you know, the argument is like, oh, well, you know, hey, I make a house. I don't get money every time somebody sells or whatever the house. It's like, right, but you're paid to make the house. You make the house and there's more work. That house does not mean you don't get to work anymore. When somebody uh, copies and pastes, you know, performances of actors, that will actually impact their ability to work anymore. And that's the issue, you know. Um, and if you've got people, you know, who are in the trades or other things saying, hey, I don't get paid for this, stop fighting amongst yourselves. <laughs> stop punching at each other and punch up. Punch up, folks. You, you, you know it's, you know, it's, it's the giant money, money capitalist class, right? You, stop. Stop yelling at each other and tradespeople and unions and immigrants and whatever else that the the that the that the rich folk keep you fighting about. Oh my God! Look up, punch up, stop it. <laughs> I think that's ultimately what the the actors strike is all about, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's it's, it's all of that. It's so um, it's the artificial intelligence protections, and then some of it's just protections. We're looking at the video game strike is. More money to keep up with inflation, and then one of the other uh, AI protections. But then um, the, one of the basics is just uh, set safety. If there's going to be any sort of like movement that is combat or could potentially be dangerous, they just want a uh, they want a stunt person or, as we you know would say in the uh, like on stage, a uh, you know a fight captain there at all times, just to make sure things are safe. Because not all of these actors that you bring in are stunt people or combat people. Just We just want somebody there to make sure everybody's safe. We don't want anybody getting hurt. Because as actors, they say, hey, do this. And we all, for the most part, it takes a while for us to go, no, 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 no. Let's slow down. Because otherwise, we all will go, yeah, you got it. Let's go. Because you just want to work. You just want to play. And you don't think until you're hurting the next day, what happened? Oh, I said yes to being thrown on that mat. And I'm not you know, good at that. Um, a buddy of mine who's up in Canada right now, he was doing a Prison Break, a, a show that would sat down wow. in Chicago. And he was. Uh, they did a sequence where there was a, a riot and his character got stabbed. And the guy that stabs him was this like six foot five heavily muscled stunt dude. And so my buddy, he was like, do stage combat all the time. I got this. And he did. We, we, we did a bunch of shows together. Let's do it. Let's right. <laughs> and <laughs> so they do take one and they're like, do you want some padding? Or whatever. He's like, nah, nah, be fine. Be fine. He gets grabbed and shivved in the chest over and over and over and over and over again. And so it's just this big dude hitting him in the chest over and over and over. They go, cut. Do we got it? No? Okay, again. Grab, grab. Stab, 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 stab. Do we have it? Yeah, but we need some coverage from over here. Okay, again. They did it like five to ten times, and this dude was not really pulling his punches as he stabbed. So my buddy, his whole chest up into his shoulders and everything, like black, 
and blue and green and purple for like two weeks. And so he was like, yeah, yeah. Next time I asked for the pad, you know, <laughs> because we were all young, really our twenties is like, we're invincible. Let's go. And you, and you want to be, you want to please everybody, you know? And then I, yeah, yeah, that's the, and so that's what the stuff that you put into contracts and union protections is to protect us from ourselves half the time. Not necessarily most, at any video game stuff I've ever worked on, people are really cognizant of asking you to do too much or vocally stressful stuff. People are really cool about it nowadays. But half of it is to protect us from just being overly zealous performers saying yes and trying to please everybody so you get called back for the next project. So any Mass Effect questions? No? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm, I think you <laughs> looking through my list of Mass Effect questions. I think you've answered every in, indirectly. You've answered like pretty much everything that I had on. Really, the that's cool. I don't have you got to... anything else, uh, Craig? Um, I'm trying to think of the top of my head. I don't know. Who's your favorite Mass Effect Andromeda companion? Oh, oh, jeez. All right. Uh, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I really like Drac, um, especially as, I, as I've gotten older. <clears throat> the 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 woman who wrote Drac, like wrote from her position as an older person, and so that was something that that stuck with me. Um, I like the Liam, uh, the Liam loyalty mission. That was an absolute blast uh, to record, and of course that's the first thing that got shown, and everybody's like, "Oh, this looks great," and I was like. That one was great. <laughs> that was well chosen, you know, a well chosen sequence to to showcase. Um, so I've got a you know soft spot for everybody, but I will say that because of the the storyline of hey, let's have a kid together, Gil. I loved that that possibility in you know in the game space. It's like as again as somebody who thought, hey, maybe we'll get some some DLC or a sequel. What does that mean for these characters to have kids? And I thought. That's cool. That's something that I'd love to explore and, you know, and have players, you know, get to explore. Mm -hmm. So it's not, so it's, it's not necessarily a fair question for me because I got soft spots for everybody, but just for that storyline, Gil. That's another thing entirely, isn't it? Like people usually stray, like steer clear of showing kids in games, like, which is, which you can kind of understand why, but like in, when you're moving an entire race to another galaxy, you kind of want to know what the repercussions of Andromeda are on the children. Mm -hmm. Life, yeah 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 there's cool stuff there's cool stuff there there was yeah like you said there's a lot of uh uh questions and other things that unanswered and possibilities and places to go with it and we don't necessarily get to know those things are you okay. currently working on anything at the moment that you're you're allowed to talk about exactly right uh <laughs> I, <laughs> uh I, I to be very honest i don't um but because of ndas if i did have anything i couldn't say anything um but no i'm not working on anything right now um it's been been a little uh been a little dry in that in that regard uh so my time is mostly uh audiobooks that's kind of like the day job um and still also works from home and <laughs> work from home in my, in my pjs and you know, cook for the family and take care of the dogs and pick up my son from school. Yeah. I can imagine there's still a little bit of play there. Like you said about the, the Mass Effect audiobook you did. Like I imagine mm -hmm. that, that there's still a little bit of freedom there and a little bit of fun you can have with, with voicing characters. And, yeah. You know. And, and, and that is how I do it. There was, um, you know, uh, uh, there have been, uh, I'm really lucky with some of the publishers that I've worked with and nobody pushes back on any of the character voices or choices that I make. Um, and I've been very fortunate in that regard. And it's because if I didn't do it that way, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be bored out of my mind. And I, I, and so it's like, look, if I'm going to do this thing, you're going to do it. You're going to do it my way. Um, years ago, I'm forgetting the name of the book. Um, but he was an author, brand new thing. And it got turned into a movie and everything. Um, but, uh, I sent in an audition, and this is through uh, Blackstone, who knew me and trusted me. And uh, <clears throat> the, the the note they got back from the author was like a very severe, no women in my books sound like that. And I'm like, I did a generic, like, lady in authority sound. And I don't, you don't do, you know, it's not Monty Python or anything like that. It, it, nobody does that. But I was like, okay. Okay. And so my, and so the, 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 the guy at Blackstone is who I've worked with for years at this point, he's like, I 
don't know what to do. Like, make a different choice. I don't know. I'm like, okay, I'll pull back on this and maybe tweak this. And then it came back as a no, no, no women. I'm like, okay. And then the 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 author wound up choosing uh, Bronson Pinchot, uh, who you might know as uh, uh, Balky Bartokamus from the Perfect Strangers show from back in the '80s. Uh, he is a very, very well known and highly regarded audiobook narrator. I'm like, well, I'm not going to compete with Bronson, and I would never uh, read the way he does. He has a very particular style, and I'm like, yeah, all right, not me, fine. Some you know, find something else. Yeah, so it's it's been freeing, and I've actually used some of the things that I've come up with in audiobooks in video games and uh animation where it's just something i explore and i go oh i know this um and as a matter of fact like rider the the scott rider voice is was something i kind of tweaked and i had in there sitting in there but then i wound up uh because i had spent like two years performing and knowing that voice, knowing that character, knowing where this sits and where it's delivered, I had the opportunity to do be the voice of Hyundai. And I, I got it. I was the voice of Hyundai for two years. And it's just, it's just rider voice. And I had people reach out to me on like Twitter. Um, is, is that you for Hyundai? I'm like, yeah, I'm the Hyundai voice now. Yeah. And it, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, as you come up with stuff and you invent, you plan, sometimes it's just, having something in your backpack, you know, oh, the, I know how to apply this and I know what to do. And it comes out sounding natural and, you know, real and believable and connectable. And you just go with it. That's, that's the, you know, that's the voice that, that sometimes that's all the thing that's finally, sometimes that's the thing that books it is just, mm. oh, this sounds natural and real. This is not put on again. Like while people say you, you come out of university or I'm ready to act and they go, no, no, just do you just do you. And that can be very hard. So sometimes you find like a tweak of you. So it's not really you, you, but it's still something that's comfortable and believable that you can call upon in a moment's notice. And especially in the commercial realm, that's exactly what they need. So I suppose there's something to say there about being yourself, I suppose. Yeah, as hard as that can be sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we say we want to like run away from ourselves is one of the reasons why you you know, become an actor. It's, I just don't want to be me. I want to run away. And it, it, it's part of the thing for me. Um, and my day-to-day -day life, just growing up, suburbs of Chicago, small town of like 2,000 people. Yeah, it's boring. And I used to play a lot in my head. And so a lot of this nowadays, again, I'm in a booth by myself, maybe somebody on the other side of the line, is playtime in my head. I'm just playing imagination. And it just happens to be my, a microphone here recording all that stuff. Um and, yeah. And so it's then, oh, oh, I got to get real and just, you know, be me. Ooh. All right. You know, so that's another level uh, of, of, uh, of performance, I think, that uh, can take time. Some people like myself, I don't think will ever get there. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's the thing to shoot for because of the it, it's one thing to run away from yourself, but it's something else to go. OK, no, I'm going to challenge myself by being here, by being myself just in the moment and, and and exploring yourself and different aspects and avenues of yourself and, and bring that to a performance and bring that to a you know a, a voice to the stage whatever it is and that's you know that's the that's the real thing that's when you're like ooh, you know that's drama ooh, that's real that's gritty and you didn't look for it elsewhere you're not putting on a silly hat or a voice or anything you're just finding a little corner of yourself that maybe you don't like and digging around in there and maybe bringing it up and kind of surprising yourself and then hopefully an audience with, oh, well, that's disgusting or, oh, that's beautiful or, oh, that's heart-wrenching. And that's, you know, that's another aspect of all of this stuff, which can be difficult to access or to admit it's time to access, you know? Mm, I can't, well, I, I, yeah, I can't, I, I can't imagine what that's like. I appreciate you guys caring from all the way, all the way, all the way over there, uh, eight hour time difference. So I appreciate it. Still not as long as the time difference between the Milky Way and Andromeda. No, it's much longer. <laughs> as, uh, uh, yeah, see, and then there's the story stuff where they get like transmissions from 300 years ago, like the little, the, they, they're slowly finding out, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa, what happened? We went to escape. What happened? Did, did they make it? And I'm like, 
no let them know what happened to everybody open yeah. the door for open the door for you know uh you know for the shadow broker like yeah. Liara, to come through there's like <laughs> <they're> story. <laughs> yeah 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 like i said I, I, so that's that's me coming at it as a fan like knowing all this other stuff that i know that we recorded there's there's more there's yeah there's there's they they really do create like all right here's a bunch of really fun legos we're gonna mash them all together and just kind of shake them up and and see what comes out and it's just a shame when they put it all together and you know what it all falls apart that they had a bunch of really neat, you know, a lot more really interesting play sets that we just never got to see. And that those writers and creators never got to explore. Yeah. Oh, I do need to know though, um, which ending do you prefer? Oh, wait, the, um, I, I think, I don't know if I prefer any of them because everything's got its, you know, I, I always, I always remember, was it the fusion? Where, oh, um, synth synthesis. Yeah, where everybody comes out sparkly and Joker walks out <laughs> sparkly and Edie's not there. And you're like, oh, right, that would... Uh. So I remember like my, my initial playthrough doing that, thinking, yeah, that's the thing. That's kind of how I, you know, uh, right, you know, do the middle, I did the middle thing, and then that happens and everybody's sparkly. And Edie's not there for Joker. I was like... Right, that, ooh, okay, that sucks. And so, yeah, there's no, that was the fun part, is that none of them quite work out. There was no happy ending. There was always some sort of sacrifice on on the part of everybody, which after what everybody had already been through, you know, kind of sucks. But that's, that's life. Mm, true. And my my final 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 question, <laughs> which, which is your Andromeda love interest? Um, God, who did I? Because I think it was, I think it was Cora, because. <laughs> so I know Danielle Rain. I've hung out with Danielle Rain. You know, we hang out. I've been over to her house, met her family, and her horse, and all sorts of stuff. It's great. Yeah, I can't do that with Vetra. No, I can't. No, there's no romance. <laughs> it's like, no, nah, that's just Danielle. This is no, nah, I can't. This is no, nah, that nah, that's awkward. You know, um, and it's like, on my it's initial like romancing your best friend. Yeah, it's like I know this person, and I like we know what we did to make the sounds in the boot. Yeah, it is awkward. It is really awkward. Um, uh, but yeah, but also like again, just for the storyline because I played back to go through stuff like the Gill. Because I remember recording that going, this is awesome, this is awesome. And then seeing the game, like, yeah, this is still awesome. Uh, so, yeah. and Which is weird because I, I, I don't know, you know, the actress who had played Cora, But I do because of her work and other things. And they, there was other people in the mix. And then they were like, no, no, just grab her. We know her. She can, we, she can nail it. And she works out. Sounds great. And she did. She was, she was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no romancing. Weird. No romancing work, friends. That's just weird. <laughs> yeah, she did do a great job. Yeah. Like I said, the performance is, like you said, top to bottom. We're just great. Not not our fault. No. <laughs> not our fault. No. No, absolutely not. No. They, uh, they shouldn't have listened to the, the angry people on Twitter. I should have stuck with it. Yeah. I mean, was there stuff to fix? Yes. But it's the, as you've seen analysis over the years, you know, it's this classic Bioware problem where they're like, no, we're going to crunch and we'll make it. The Bioware magic will just happen in the X three months. And in, that worked for a little while. And it just did not with Andromeda. It just, it just didn't. They, they, they blew it on that one. Uh, oh, well, they came back and they fixed it. And there's still like, you go and play that today. There's still a good game. Um, the the combat the lead combat designer I still follow him I think he's over I think he's over making Star Wars games now and I was like dude my, the combat's my favorite thing he's like oh thank mm -hmm. you I said no 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 I enjoyed it I was like these are great tools and placing there were times when I was skipping dialogue to get to the next fun combat sequence because I knew the dialogue right you know I I'd recorded it I, I you know I don't need to see it Dottie I lived it but this combat, this combat's so good. So yeah, that's so that was fun when uh, when Josh and I were streaming the game before it came out, playing the uh, the, the the multiplayer 
you know, the, the multiplayer preview that was there out there before the game came out, that was a blast because the combat was so good. We do need to give um, Mass Effect Andromeda multiplayer a proper chance, but we've been playing a lot of the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. Still good. Yeah. Still, yeah, still holds up. And that was a fun thing is that people doing that. And then a lot of the community were like, right, this is good, but we're, we're still playing three, <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing because, you know, that's generationally, it's such a long time ago and that it still has this core group of players uh, playing it. It's fantastic. You play? Uh, no, not now. Um, <laughs> I did. I, I, you know, I did back in the day. I am, uh, I am a grazer of games as I got older. And, you know, I think I made the joke on Twitter or whatever last week that I've got, you know, I've got a couple bucks for a change. And so I buy the games, but I don't play like anything to completion. I beat Breath of the Wild earlier this year after five years. And it's because I knew the sequel was coming and I've put a few hours into that and that got tabled for a vacation and then remnant two came out and then Baldur's gate came out and it's like so did you buy these games yes i bought all these games what are you playing right now uh the free f099 because <laughs> it's real good you know uh or uh uh treachery and beat down city he just came out with the ultra mix of that and that's an older game and i'm like well i'm gonna put that in the queue and like i said the the deck builder things that just they they get me and they steal my time and yeah, I'm just, I'm, I like to graze um, because, uh, because of, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Game Pass and things like that. And I finally have, you know, some computers that can actually run almost anything now. And I love like the handheld stuff, like the Steam Deck and the, the ROG Ally. Uh, so I can play while I wait for my son, to wait to pick up my, you know, my son from school. Um, so yeah, this last week, uh, Station to Station, a cozy little puzzle game with trains. Uh, I'd never played a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game. So Tony Hawk was on sale on Steam, uh, one and two, the remakes or the remasters. So I got those. Um, Beneath Oressa, uh, a deck builder, very good, very, uh, uh, looks, uh, you know, a nice clean look. I really enjoyed Gunbrella, uh, which is a, a, a platformer, still dipping in and out of uh, Armored Core 6. Uh, Blasphemous 2 came out at the end of, end, of, end of August, so I picked that one up because I love the first Blasphemous, uh, and I, I play it in in Spanish because those performances are just perfect, and with the visuals, it's even more perfect. I've got, what is it, like 20 to 30 hours in Remnant 2. Uh, I and my friends love the first one, so we played Remnant 2 a lot. Um, and then with the new update, uh, we started dipping back into uh, uh, Warhammer 40K Dark Tide. Um, I love... I love 40k. <laughs> I, I love 40k. It's my like, it's one of those things that I read the books, I play the games, and it's because it is just, it's shameless in, it's in the atrocities of everything. Everybody's terrible. There's a bunch of fascist Roman stuff. And yep, it's terrible. And, you know, the, 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 you know the alien the mutant the heretic all of it and the designs are ridiculous and over the top and everything is big and huge and it's and it's and it's explosiony and it's one of those few things where i can from the voice acting and everything i cannot think about work um even the books i'm able to read and not think about book, uh work uh i like indie games because they don't remind me of work i hear work i actually had to return a game uh that i picked up on sale uh because the voice acting was so bad I couldn't play it. I was like, this is unplayable because I, I can't. Um, yeah, so there's only so many things that I can do that don't remind me of work nowadays. Uh, comic books, for some reason, don't remind me of audiobook work. And then, like, an indie game that's just text and no voice acting. Those are, ah, those are my happy spaces. Which is, again, I think also why, um, you know, football uh, appealed to me is that I'm not watching people perform. I'm not, I don't have a... It takes a lot for me to turn off the actor, performer, whatever, uh, when watching shows, films, whatever. Um, or it's got to be like a property them into um, to not watch the performances or listen or critique or have something in my back in the back of my mind doing that. Uh, reading a book, I, the narration mode starts to kick in. I can't. Um, video games too. I'll start to hear. I go, 
Oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, that's so-and-so. Oh, there's Frida again. Dang it. I'm not playing the game anymore. Dang it. You know, like I know half the cast of like Spider-Man and everything like that. Uh, but it was so good. I was able to overcome. That's just Yuri. That's, uh, you know, um, and the guy that's playing uh, Miles uh, in the Spider-Man games is phenomenal phenomenal and of course and i love uh, william as uh, as doc ock but everybody in that really did so great i was able to actually play those games and enjoy them um and not just go ah it's yuri oh there's yeah you know there's this person like i'm in spider-man too it's like and i've heard myself in the cutscene. like ah, there, there you go that was <laughs> that was my 15 minutes during covid <laughs> um uh during lockdown when they just needed people to fill in some of the holes um yeah yeah so I'm, I, I graze because I, I, it's, it takes a lot for me to just sit down and go through a game. And I'm envious of my friends uh, who I watch like on Discord as they go through stuff. Um, a friend of mine plays the, the Yakuza games. And I just, I just call it my stories because I sit down, oh, Sean's playing Yakuza. All right, I'm going to watch my stories as he plays the game. Because half the time I'm just, after I get everybody to bed, I'm just too wiped out to, to, to play. Just part of getting old. You, you finally have the money, but don't have the time to do any of the gaming you used to do. Oh, I know that feeling. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's just like, ah, uh, well. But I also, especially with smaller independent games, things like that, I'm happy to buy something for $10, $15, $20, play a few hours and know, okay, I, fin I, I, I didn't finish it. I didn't beat the game or whatever, but I had fun. And hopefully this developer like takes the sale and go, you know, make something else. You know, I, I get to kind of put something back into an industry that did so many cool things for me as a player and then also as a performer. And so that's like, go, go make more things. You know, I've had the opportunity to make things and I've done all right. I'm still doing all right. Uh, you know, are you young, scrappy developers like the folks that like, like the young horses, the guys that made, uh, you know, Octodad and, uh, and uh, Bug Snacks? Like, go guys, go. You know, I knew them as college students and now they are parents themselves with homes and mortgages and a team and they just got somebody to manage their social their social media after being a studio for 10 years you know like that is like yes go i don't i, I don't care that i don't finish this here here's here's the money go make go make something and so is there anything that you, you're wanting to promote at the minute anything that you want um, people to know about no but thank you all for playing and giving a rat's ass for this thing <laughs> this thing that you know, it was kind of dead and gone uh, a long time ago, but was something that we absolutely had a blast uh, doing. And so if there are people that are interested and people still playing, you know, I will still retweet all the writers that everybody shares with me. And it's still a, a fun thing that there are people out there playing it and that it holds that I did or made anything or had a hand in making anything that people you know, hold that dear, that's amazing to me. I never thought that that would be part of anything that I did. You know, um, my name's on the Star Wars wiki. And it's, it may seem small, but like, like I've worked on a Star War. Like this, this, these things in my born in 1977 mind, I saw Return of the Jedi in the theater front row. I still have the, uh, the, uh, the, the program magazine that they handed out. Like, that's it blows my mind to be a part of any of this stuff. And then again, to, to have a part of mass effect. And so that people care and they reach out and they say, Hey, I care. That's amazing. And thank you all for caring. <laughs> I mean, it's, if, if we, we know, we don't know what's happening with the next mass effect though, do we? So no, it could, no. There, there could be, there could be room for something involving Ryder. We never know, do we? Oh, what was it? Gamble put out the other day. <laughs> He's something, something, something. Oh, I'm thinking about, and yes, I'm thinking about N7 Day. All right. What are you going to do? We don't know. No, we don't know. <laughs> so it'll be interesting. We'll see. Well, we, we'll, we will be excited to, to hear your voice again involving Mass Effect. Oh, thank you. I hope so. We'll, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do people find you if, if they want to send you their shepherds or uh, the riders? Shepherds? <laughs> uh, still, I'll never know. 
Always in the shadow of the shepherd. Um, <laughs> which is true. Which is true. That was we were trying to run away from that as we built the game. Which is this. That's we did. We get it. Um, Twitter. I will not call it the other name. I am at Taylorson. I have similar. I believe Instagram is Polixenes. That's a Shakespeare reference. Um, and uh, my website, www.tomtaylorson.com. Uh, you can see, you know, the, the corporate side, but there's a little area we can send me like a little email. You can shoot me an email and say, I don't know, send me a thing. There's people sending me things once in a blue moon to sign. I'll, I'll do that. Um, but yeah, uh, it's mostly uh, Twitter until that crashes and burns. And then, like, I don't know, we'll find something else. I think maybe I'm on Blue Sky. That's Taylorson. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there. Uh, thank you ever so much for for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you again for having me. Pleasure. Oh, uh, right. yeah. I'll, uh, I'll I'll pop you a, a, an email with any other questions I've got. Or yeah, I'll try to keep it. Uh, I'll try to keep it to a tight five. <laughs> <laughs> try. It's a, yeah, it was it was a pleasure though. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. If you have any comments, questions, or ideas about future episodes, be sure to find us on our socials. You can find Tim at... Uh, Proppy54 on Twitter or Proppy54Gaming on YouTube. And you can find me on Twitter or X with the tag at Craig and his Mac. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thanks a lot. <laughs>